So welcome to our panel on Created to Thrive, CBE's uh, a resource addressing abuse and creating healthy and safe congregations in Christian communities. Um, this is our illustrious panel, four of our key authors. And I would like to begin uh, by just some brief introductions. So would you each take a minute to introduce yourself? Okay. I am um, Antoinette Alvarado. I go by Dr. Tony, as everybody calls me affectionately. Um, I actually live here in the greater metropolitan Atlanta area uh, in a little city called Conyers, Georgia, mm. um, about east of, of Atlanta, south, uh, east of Atlanta. Um, I have um, been serving in my ministry context is serve, um, serving alongside my husband as the co-pastor of our local church, which we founded 30 years ago here in, uh, in Atlanta. And um, so I'm a pastor. Um, um, we have three young adult children. Uh, it's oxymoronic to me to say adult and children <laughs> in the same sentence, but we have three young adult children, uh, two, um, two sons and a daughter. Um, I am also the founder of My Sister's Keeper Foundation for Women, mm. which is a nonprofit organization. Um, we've been, um, we are 18 years old now, mm. and most of our work has been done in the metropolitan area of Atlanta, although we've had women uh, uh, engaging our programs from other parts of the country. And we focus on leadership development, mm -hmm. professional and personal development, coach through the medium of coaching. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also the president of Targeted Living Coaching and Consulting. Well, you are very busy. <laughs> and thank you so much for being on our panel. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Chinese? Good evening. My name is J.R. Newton. It's John Rich Newton, but everybody calls me J.R. <laughs> I am from Dallas, Texas. I'm the president and founder of a nonprofit called Tapestry Ministries, and we provide emergency sheltering to women that are desperately running from domestic violence situations, we will put them up, uh, house them until we can get them into the shelters. Uh, we also do conferences. We do, I preach, I teach, uh, I do a lot of that. Our, our ministry also uh, has had a program for the last 21 years called the YES program, Youth Expecting Success. And we have taken young people that are 13 to 18 years old that are in school and we do uh, college readiness, uh, all kind of life skill classes so that when they go out into the world, they're ready. So a lot of these young people are first generation, sometimes high school graduates and definitely first generation college graduates. So we have college graduates, those that have gone on for advanced degrees all over the country. Uh, so we've been doing that for about 21 years. Um, I'm also a registered nurse. I work with a nonprofit called City Square. We do uh, rapid housing for uh, formerly homeless neighbors. I am the author of my book, Plug, <laughs> Healing, Voices. Healing Voices. It is a collection of 11 women's stories that have endured domestic abuse mm -hmm. and survived because of their faith in God. Mm -hmm. And my story is one of these stories. Uh, each story is followed by a spiritual reflection by a female pastor uh, to kind of give it, they're heavy, so it kind of lifts, uh, uh, lifts some hope into those messages. Uh, I have three children and, a, and an adopted child, and they're all adults. And I have five, four grandsons and one great granddaughter. Oh. And I'm so proud of them. Thank you, JR. Liz? <laughs> uh, my name is Liz Beyer, and I work with CBE. I've been working with them since 2008. I started out uh, running the online bookstore and reviewing books. And so that's kind of how I got involved in uh, ultimately working on this resource was when I realized that there really is a dearth of Christian resources that adequately address this topic. And um, I have five grown kids, four girls and a boy, and two grandkids, and they're scattered all over the country, which makes me sad because um, I don't get to see them often. But um, 
They really have inspired me and uh, in many ways made me who I have become. And um, yeah, so. Thank you. Jean Porter King. Hello everyone, I'm Jean Porter King and <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the founding president of a um, consultant um, consultancy that does leadership development, diversity, equity, and inclusion for corporations, nonprofits, etc. So leadership development is huge for me. It's the way I make my living and my voice. So I wrote about that in this book. I'm also, um, I serve as executive pastor of my church in South Holland, Illinois, which is outside of Chicago. And my husband is the senior pastor, so we minister together. He is here tonight or today. I'm an author, have two books coming up, um, 2023 and 2024. And uh, I have the privilege of serving on the board for CBE. And um, some of that story we'll hear throughout. So it's a privilege to um, work with um, the board members that are here and Mimi as our CEO. I'm also a caregiver, so one of the reasons I'm getting here so late is we have to attend to my 91-year-old mother with resources, and um, the Lord worked it out this week, and I could be here for at least one day. And I'm Mimi Haddad, and it's my pleasure to be moderator. I did contribute a, a chapter as well. So let's begin with our panelists, and if you would mind, could kindly tell us how you got involved in the book and what chapter did you write and just a brief introduction on the content okay i'll start mm -hmm. so um i got involved with the book with the creative um to thrive project through jean <laughs> she invited me to be a part of this um writing um, project and experience which i appreciate um the chapter that i wrote is um entitled strategies for coaching women in ministerial leadership and it is building upon my D-Man work um, at Regent University, my pastoral experience, um, my training as a certified um, life coach and coach trainer, and the nonprofit organization, uh, My Sister's Keeper Foundation for Women. So all of that work uh, kind of coalesced mm -hmm. in my chapter, um, my experience as a pastor and a coach. Um, it focuses on coaching models for women in leadership, particularly church leadership. And I strongly encourage pastors and church leaders to develop coaching models or create a coaching uh, environment, mm -hmm. if you will, in your church. Um, one that cultivates leadership skills, um, the, um, having women to acknowledge, accept, celebrate, um, their leadership gifts and personality values mm -hmm. and their approach to Christian living and, um, and ministry, practice of ministry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donnie. Mm -hmm. JR? My uh, contribution to this wonderful work came with an invitation from Liz yeah. and from you mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to uh, develop the section of the book on preaching and teaching regarding domestic violence. Um, it is not taught and preached nearly enough as it should be in congregations. You know, I would take polls of groups of people and I went, when is the last time you've heard a sermon mm -hmm. on domestic violence? And nobody raises their hand. But one in three women, women are affected worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a problem when the church is not teaching and preaching those messages and we're supposed to be the ones that are ministering to those that are hurting. So I, um, I did three sermons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three sermons uh, is my contribution. And that's kind of my niche is that I really love to get up under and around and go through the scriptures and really pull out those things that, because a lot of times women in the Bible are portrayed very negatively. Uh, they are given very bad names. <laughs> and I want to lift those voices up. Sometimes they don't even have a name. Mm -hmm. So I have to let everybody know their name is our name, you mm -hmm. know, so we are those women. Mm -hmm. So I have really enjoyed this and, and uh, I just love working with CBE and thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you for being here. 
Liz? Uh, I edited and project managed the book. And um, in terms of inviting John Rees, she was a speaker at our 2017 conference. And I attended her workshop. And I was really deeply impacted by it because she spoke a, a lot about the infrastructure and the support network that they've created in their church. And I realized I don't know anyone who has any kind of network or foundation or even any knowledge of what domestic violence is. And um, so you were one of the first people I thought of <laughs> when I was thinking about this project. And this project really was many years in the making. Um, when I first started at CBE, there were a number of resources written by Christians about domestic violence, one in particular, uh, uh, Women Abuse in the Bible, that was authored by, or it was an anthology edited by Kathy Krager and James uh, Beck, and then it went out of print. It was an excellent book because it did, it did kind of an overview. It touched on a little bit of everything, all of the facets that people need to know, particularly pastors. And it went out of print, and then, you know, because I review books, uh, for the organization, I just couldn't find anything that didn't do uh, partially blame the victim for uh, their outcomes. Mm -hmm. and, and their solutions just weren't real solutions. So anyway, it was very frustrating. So anyway, we, uh, that was th the reason we looked into developing this yeah. book, because it's really necessary. Desperately needed. <clears throat> well, I got involved with the writing project by the invitation of Liz, and um, as we brainstormed and she gave me the vision for what she wanted, she wanted a leadership component, and for that section, I invited Dr. Tony to join me because we do work together around leadership and influence, and that year we had really started doing some, and I just thought of the work that she did. But for me, why I saw this chapters or this section as important is um, the infrastructure for handling abuse, preventing abuse, describing abuse is absolutely important. And I think leaders are critical for cultivating the culture, the culture that is abuse free. And abuse is emotional and physical, but it's also an abuse of a gifts in not acknowledging women as leaders and that God calls us equally and equitably, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a pleasure I contributed to. Um, and one was a straight out um, looking at barriers that women face in church leadership at multiple levels from the personal, intrapersonal barriers, interpersonal barriers, and then the organizational and structural barriers. So that's looking at that, breaking those down, and then another one was an adaptation. I, I didn't even offer this one. I had to go back and write a whole new chapter. <laughs> Liz has a way. She says she's introverted and quiet, but Liz has a way. Uh, so um, some of you may have remembered this book years ago. Um, I published it in 20, um, 2000, Leading Ladies, and it had four archetypes of women's leadership. And she asked, can we revisit that and revise it? And I've since, in the work that I do as a consultant, have six models around influence for women. So we adapted and merged, and we now provide six styles of leadership that you may want to um, help uh, women identify their gifts. And um, pastors especially, these are things you want to look for. You know, the quiet one, the, the one that's outspoken, et cetera. But we give you a template of six styles of leadership that could be helpful. Yes, Liz is in touch with the whole breadth of egalitarian ideas and literature, and so she's definitely the brain bank um, at CBE. Each panelist, could you let us know uh, some of the common ideas and thought processes or assumptions that are made that fuel abuse, and what ideas and um, pathways forward do you see? Uh, and it particularly maybe as it relates to your chapter, your life experiences. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to piggyback on what Jean just said about um, lead, uh, women, recognizing women's leadership and leadership styles. And I think it starts with women 
ourselves, seeing ourselves as um, leaders. And um, I think that sometimes the notion that we are not leaders, then um, we sometimes can be put in positions where we um, don't see ourselves the way God sees us. We imagine they, imagine they in the image of God. And so I think for me, the whole coaching aspect is helping women identify their leadership skills. Some of the common, I'm thinking about a common conversation that's happening right now, mm -hmm. where a prominent <coughs> minister, a preacher, bishop, a few weeks ago um, preached a sermon and in the sermon said that we are not raising our women to be women, we're raising them to be men. And this is a very prominent bishop, particularly in African-American church. Mm. And so it's a, it's a discussion going on right now. And a lot of people, he's come under some fire for what he said. Mm -hmm. and, he, and, for, and he went on to illustrate and say that, you know, um, while we're in the C-suite and we're climbing the corporate ladder and we're getting educated, our men are feeling left out. Our men are feeling like they don't have anything to give. And our and the and our family is falling apart. Well, how injurious is that thinking? Um, for, um, so then that puts on women the responsibility for how men feel, or it puts on women the sole responsibility for the health of the family. And why can't we be leaders and wives and mothers? So I think that some of that thinking yeah. contributes to abuse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a friend of mine put it this way tony we've been told men are men are telling us that they feel they've been put in the back seat and my friend says well you've told us that's a very great place to be for years and years and years yeah <laughs> exactly and, and you know women are told you can't have it all men are never told no them. right men are not told you can't have it all they're not told you can't be married and climb the corporate right. ladder or be a pastor or whatever women are told that mm -hmm. and so i think that 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 mindset yeah leads to um abuse of gifts mm -hmm. um and I think women maybe even self-sabotage mm. and abuse themselves mm. because they internalize those messages. Mm -hmm. Dehumanizing. JR. Well, um, having years of um, teaching and preaching to women's groups uh, has led me to really have a passion for making sure those voices are heard. Uh, I was telling my son about a situation, uh, a rape situation that a woman was in. I didn't, of course, didn't share names, but he looked at me and he said, Mom, that sounds like silent noise. I said, silent noise. And then I thought about it. It is silent noise. While the abuse is going on, while those attacks are going on, while those, uh, uh, atrocities are going on there's some noise going on right it's it's, it's some arguments it's some slaps it's some words being it's a lot going on but once the, you step outside the door mm -hmm. you don't hear that it's silent mm -hmm. and we and women are being silenced where our voices are being silenced so i want to be able to give voice mm -hmm. to the silent noise mm -hmm. it is something going on it is something being said mm -hmm. and even in the scriptures when Women are given names such as slave, handmaid, concubine, wife. So they give a they give a, a description, mm -hmm. but there's no name. Mm -hmm. You know, she's not honored enough to even be given a name. Uh, so so many women are just, who are you? Oh, I'm Mary, the handmaiden. Oh, I'm Jane, the cupbearer. Or whatever you know. So there's not a name being given to these women. So I wanted to be able to uh, give women voices. And when I, like this book, this is the first volume. So volume two is on the way. Uh, and I'll keep writing until, I, I named it volume one and volume two. I, I named it that for a reason, mm -hmm. because there's always going to be a voice that needs to be lifted. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if I can lift those voices and I, and I can get our 
religious church community to understand that those voices are important and not to ignore them, you know, and minister to them. They're sitting there, you know, they, they're hurting. You know, they're serving in leadership in your churches and they're hurting, but they don't feel supported. So if I can lift those voices and give women voices, I didn't find my voice until someone uh, came to me and said, you know, this is what I got out of your class. This is why I've been on drugs for years because of, and then she started pouring all of this stuff out. And I'm just like, oh gosh, you need to tell this to somebody. And she said, well, I can't write very well. And then out of my mouth flew, well, if you tell it to me, I'll write it down. Now, where are we going with this? I don't know. <laughs> but it, I felt she needed, she needed to have her say. So, and that's how, you know, woman after woman, just God put them there. I said, oh, I'll only do five. God said, 10. I said, okay, seven is good. By the time I got to seven, it took me 12 years. I was tired. <laughs> I'm like, like, oh no, 10. And then when I got to 10, then he says, tell your story. That took me two years mm -hmm. just to be able to give my own voice because I had told no one. Mm -hmm. I had told no one. No one yeah. in my family knew. So That's it's liberating. The voice to tell is liberating your story. to tell your story. Thank you. I had a really difficult time answering this one. I... I think probably to my way of thinking that the primary driver of abuse is the value we place on women. And I've been thinking a lot lately about women are valuable and I think that we're recognized as valuable because of our economic labor, mm -hmm. the fact that we give birth, we reproduce. You only need one man to reproduce with multiple women, to create lots of children. I mean, and this is sort of a worldly way of viewing things. Mm -hmm. But how do you control that resource? You control that resource by convincing them that they don't have value, that they're not important, that they can't do things. I mean, I think it's like a double-edged sword. And I think the church has not realized that they've picked up some of those ideas without recognizing one where they come from and I mean because most of the men I know these things would never occur to them they they simply don't see it and I think um, so I think it's really important I think one of the barriers is just not recognizing the bias and recognizing uh, and even as a woman, you know, it took me a long time to realize that making me feel bad about myself was a great way to control me and control what I did, whether I spoke, you know, whether I tried to point something out to my congregation. Uh, the tool works really well. And so I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but there, I think that's a very, I think that's where it starts is uh, <laughs> it's, it's a double-edged sword, you know, it's a... That's great. Yeah. Hey. I think when um, I think of the underlying assumptions that uh, lead to the barriers, especially around leadership, I'll focus on what I do around leadership. Um, I'm writing a, a, a new book that's intersectional, but it fuels this one and um, some quick stories. Um, I think one of the assumptions that get made about women that prevent us from leading fully is this what I call an invisibility barrier or invisibility bias. And it's, um, I, I was uh, at a service in which the long and short of it is the, the pro another prominent leader touts the power of this particular denomination being the largest um, denominational organization led by men, in this case, black men. And I remember being shocked by it. I'm not a part of it, but being shocked and said, okay, that right there, 
speaks of an invisibility, that women are vital and crucial to this church organization, and it would not be effective or successful without the women. It shows up in corporate in other ways. It shows up in the corporate arena in um, um, tracking women to support roles instead of profit and loss roles or operational roles, or when we get in meetings and uh, we get interrupted as if we're not there, or um, we make an idea and it plops on the table as if we said nothing. So that in notion, and every woman in this room can probably say, I've experienced whether I'm in the church or the, and that's because I do the intersectional work, church and marketplace, I'm amazed at the same biases and issues that I see, right? So invisibility is one. Um, um, another one is um, emotionality, however you might want to phrase that, that uh, women don't make good leaders because of our emotions. You know, speaking intersectionally, race and gender, as a black woman, the label becomes the angry black woman. Um, or uh, Hillary Clinton, whatever your politics was, as a white woman, she was labeled as the nasty woman. So any woman who has strength and gives voice is a an anomaly to the paradigm that says we're not to be in that arena. And then the last one I just want to share is what I call the second string um, teen phenomenon. And Dr. Tony and I have talked about this. It was in my second book, Leading Lessons. And I was teaching at North Park University at the time. Our dear doctor here is still at North Park. And one of the admins from a different department comes running down the hall. She's so excited. This very popular. You notice we're being very kind and we're not calling these men out because these would be three. And this one that, um, you know what? She was so excited. He said, she named him, I won't, says that um, God has no choice but to use women when men aren't in their rightful places. And of course, I uh, immediately jumped in and said, by saying that, you're suggesting that we're in God, on God's second string team. God knew who we were, when God called us, et cetera, et cetera. That was, if I left North Park in 2000, so that would have been roughly 2000, 1999 maybe. I recently, this had to have been two years ago, uh, my husband comes home and says, you know, such and such, such and such, he listens to this Christian radio station that I don't listen to for um, a number of reasons. <laughs> and uh, he, he said, such and such uh, made a comment that I thought you'd really be intrigued with. I said, what was it? He said that, you know, God has no choice but to use women when men aren't in their rightful places. And I said, you know what? He was saying that 20 years ago and has not gotten the revelation yet. So this notion that we're second string, that we, um, it's an insult to men, just as that comment you made was an insult to men. It's an insult to women. Um, and, you know, my argument is God does not have a second string. We're all needed and all um, um, invited and also very valuable. So those, I think, are a few of the underlying assumptions that fuel the invisibility of women and at least the, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The um, theories that we shouldn't be in leadership, whether it's in the church or in the marketplace. Yeah, that's great. Great, great. Gender essentialism. So Tony, um, what, <clears throat> we're looking at our life lessons, the things that the great wisdom we've gained over the years and you all have so much of that. What, how did that undergird your chapter? Where do you feel like your big life lessons were somewhere in that chapter or all over it? Well, um, I think for me, I'm thinking about vocation and call, but I look at vocation and call from, there's a book um, Parker Palmer wrote, oh, yeah. uh, Let Your Life Speak. Yeah, yeah. oh great. And um, I use that book actually in my DMN work, but I also, it, in my dissertation, but I also use it with the with the group of women that we coach at my sisters through my sisters keeper foundation. Mm. And so I think is it Jr. Did I say it right? Jr. was talking about women's stories and lifting their stories, and even the stories that Jean taught um, in her work. I've read several of her books, and she shares the stories of women in the corporate sector and even in the church. And I think for for me. Um, when I look at my life, it speaks to 
who I am and what God has called me to do and be. And I think for me, coaching is about helping women reflect on their life, Mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the ugly, whatever Mm -hmm. that is, and seeing how God somehow weaves all of that together and it it can be used Mm -hmm. for whatever purpose. When you were talking about your book and the women's stories and then God told you to share your story, all of that Mm -hmm. is um, capital. It can Mm -hmm. be used. And I think that um, when we talk about value, we need to look at every aspect of our lives. I was talking to Michelle at lunch. We were at lunch together. Michelle Williams, who just, if you haven't done her, been in her workshops, I've been eating all her workshops up all weekend. Um, but she was talking about her story and her childhood, and we shared a little bit about our childhood and our upbringing. I'm from Chicago originally, and <clears throat> she was sharing her upbringing. And I was saying to her that um, in my work, uh, in my dissertation, I use some of J. Robert Clinton's work, and he talks about sovereign foundations, the things that we have no control over. We have no control over where we were born, who we were born to, uh, our ethnicity, our gender, all those things were, you know, and were selected for us in some ways. And so in a lot of ways. And so she was saying that because of her upbringing, she realizes now why God has her in this DEI space. Mm. And I said, that's the kind of thing that we do at My Sister's Keeper. We help women really look at their stories, Mm -hmm. all of it cry about it, whatever, but now let's see what can we take from that and how does that inform who you are, who God shaped you to be and what God has called you to do. And it's a sense of empowerment. Mm-hmm. And so we, and so for me, when I look at my story, the, the, all of it, mm. it all works together to mm. make me the empowered woman that I am. And I learn more from my failures than I did my success. Right. Right. The pain of life is also the fuel of life. Right. Thank you. Sure. Well, I have through just my life's journey, I have uh, learned to appreciate those things that I thought would destroy me. The things that sometimes you think will destroy you, will take your breath away are the things that are your greatest ministry. So, you know, when those things happen, it's ugly, it's nasty, it's painful. But just know that on the other side of that, God is going to use that experience to be able to help someone else to, to you know, bring the message around. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can remember when I was a pregnant teenager and I went to, you know, they call you, this is back in the 70s, so they don't do that today. Thank mm-hmm. God. <laughs> but they, um, the counselor called me in, I guess, to tell me that I could no longer attend school and I would have to go to an alternative school. And she told me, she said, you should probably consider a vocation like, you know, cosmetology or, you know, hotel, restaurant. I'm like, as you look at my hair, I don't do hair, right? So (laughs) then or now. And because I had already applied to a university, had been accepted, Mm. but now I'm pregnant and now I can't go, right? Mm. But I have to go locally, but you can still go, right? You just got to change locations. And so... I said, okay, and I left her feeling, why would she, as a black woman, not encourage me to say, hey, push past this, you got, you know, still got nothing, but, you know, try Mm -hmm. to send me down another path that she had tradition, but because of her biases, said that I was uh, not qualified for. So when I graduated from college, I I went back to the school. probably shady but I did it anyway I, took it. <laughs> I went back to the school and I asked for her and I just uh, gave her an invitation to my graduation and said you're welcome to come and I just wanted to let you know that, yeah. you know so, so <laughs> yeah, don't go there you know you don't know me like that so uh, so I did that but I'm I'm looking past that experience it took me seven years i had kids to raise i had to work four jobs you know it wasn't just like i walked up in there right so i I had to i had my own bed i had to make but i still made it so i try to when i work with young people i try to tell them this is not the end this is this is not you know don't don't discount yourself 
Don't go by what other people tell you. If God has put something in your, put a fire in your belly, by God, you better burn it. You know, you go and, and live that, that experience. So uh, the reason why I named our nonprofit Tapestry is because I did this sermon once where I just saw this quilt and it just had really soft places and some places were really dark, some were scratchy, some were smelly, some were colorful and bright. And there was this dark spot in the middle that it was just, it was just, it was just horrible. But all of these other pieces made up who we are, made up who I am. Mm-hmm. And I needed every last one of that piece. I didn't, you know, it, it would be incomplete if I took that dark piece out. It had to be there. Mm-hmm. And we still live w- with it. It's, it's all woven in there mm-hmm. and it's all good. You know, it is who we are. So we have those dark places. We have those places that we think we're not going to get out of. So I, when I talk to these women, I'm like, you know, they're telling me stuff that usually I have to just like take me a couple of days and cry and I have to get myself to get a nerd bad, you know, <laughs> because the stories are so painful. But I tell them, keep talking, keep talking, because it happened in my own family. My nieces were uh, molested by their father, you know, in my family. Are you kidding? So my family needed to be healed. And, and my niece is now my greatest advocate. She, wherever I go, she goes with me. You know, if we're speaking, she said, Annie, I'm right there with you. And she's telling her story. She said, I'll never stop talking. Mm-hmm. I'll ne- my sister, I'll never stop talking. Mm-hmm. So if nothing else, it healed my family. Mm-hmm. So the, mm-hmm. your voice is powerful. Mm-hmm. It's powerful. That's why, I, that's why, you know, those that do not want to hear our voice work so hard to keep it quiet because mm-hmm. it's so much power. Yeah, yeah. Speak and speak. Liz? Um... I didn't write a chapter in it, so um, I think the biggest lesson that undergirded this project was the necessity for everyone in the body of Christ to understand and be part of the healing. Um, You know, because I started doing, because there weren't very many books, I started just doing a lot of research, just a lot of reading on my own, both secular and Christian, trying to understand it myself. and really came to the conclusion that this is not a one facet type of thing. You can't just describe domestic violence and say, this is what it looks like, and then send everybody home. Uh, you, it, the book is divided basically into two sections. The first section describes what domestic violence is, different types of violence, um, the impacts of violence, there's a chapter in there on the health impacts of even coercive control. How if it goes over on for years and years and years, it can literally destroy children. I mean, mothers bearing their children, it can impact the baby in the womb, all the stress hormones and those types of things. The second part is really b- building the structure that will help prevent this happening in the future. And that, in, that needs everybody that needs pastors to be on board, the elders to be on board, for the congregants to know what it is, to recognize it, to see the signs in their friends, to partner with organizations in the community that can do the parts you can't do. Um, And and there are more things being published, but they're mostly academic, and that was the other thing, is I wanted this to be accessible. I wanted pastors of churches who had not gone to seminary to be able to pick up this book and at least begin the journey and start thinking about it. And so I think the biggest lesson I learned is that it, it takes us all to be able to address it. So Very powerful work. We sold almost a thousand copies and it hasn't been out a year yes. yet. <laughs> and that was just the genius and the Holy Spirit behind all of it. You know, I'm just so grateful. One organization bought, I think, 700 copies? 300, she 300 bought 300 copies, copies to, yeah, to, well, copies. that was just for one event. She was giving everybody a copy. So yes, just keep praying that people do that. Yeah. So Jean. Yeah. Well, JR, first let me say, uh, I was going to try to figure out how to get my locks up like that. So though you may not enjoy doing hair, it's slamming, okay? <laughs> Serious glamour. It is gorgeous, and I've got to figure out how to get the updo. So two life lessons. 
um, primarily because I wrote two chapters. But the first is, um, how do I want to say it? That when I had it down. So breaking down barriers for women, the lesson out of that for me is that um, what we do as women when we lead may look different than what men do. And often from my social science background, my doctorate is in the social sciences, many studies in the early days always compared whatever we did to men. And so Caddy K. Claire Shipman, if you remember, they had a book, The Confidence Code. And they called this out also, that confidence in women does not always look the same as confidence in men. And often the standards for men are around, you know, braggadocia, verbosity, et cetera, et cetera. And I've trained and taught enough women across the world now and heard many of them say, I'm actually very quite confident, but I'm quieter because I don't show up the way, you know, colleagues think I should. They think I'm lacking confidence. So the, the first thing, the life lesson was um, um, what, what looks like leadership for us might be different. And there's a, a saying that says, if you can see it, you can be it, whatever your style might be. And I'm a granddaughter of my first pastor uh, was a woman. My um, grandmother, uh, her, her husband had passed. They ministered together. And we come out of a tradition that honored women in um, ministry, preaching ministry. So four or five, six-year-old girls seeing a woman in the pulpit was nothing. And it wasn't until I got elsewhere to realize, oh, people have biases against us. What? <laughs> and then I hit a bunch of guilt on me that I did the research in college and graduate school. Well, did God really call me? You know, maybe they're right. You know, was Granny an anomaly? Right? So this whole notion of if you can see it, you can be it. And one of the things that I always want to do is present the images and the pictures of women in leadership. And I did that initially by showing um, women leaders in scripture. For those that claim they're not there, they're there. Um, and then again, the, the last one is that whole notion of style that leading for us may look different. And so um, the life lesson is in that second chapter that I wrote is we, can, we lead differently and that's okay. And um, the way I coach and train and develop leaders and work with CEOs on down is that whether you're a man or a woman, there's two dimensions to leadership that are very critical. It's what we might call a take charge, directive, strategic is what I call it. You've got to have a vision. You're taking people somewhere, right? Otherwise, you're going on a walk and people are just following you. But then there's also the care component because leadership is so much about relationship. And so whether you're male or female, I argue that both of those are important. Many of us as women do lean towards the care side. Not all of us do. So when we show up strong and assertive, we get labeled aggressive. And the B word, barracuda. It's a Christian audience. <laughs> <laughs> so the reality is we show the range of styles um, to again affirm all of us that you can lead. I believe, you know, there's a leadership component to almost anything God has called you to do, whether you have the title or not. And so the life lesson is we have a range of ways in which we lead and they need to be celebrated, affirmed, lifted up, and made visible. Excellent. Thank you. So very quickly, we'll just uh, hit this question. What are, do you see the biggest barriers to preventing abuse and how can these be addressed well? Um, I would say the cultures of secrecy and silence. Secrecy and silence. And mm -hmm. I, um, one of the things I think could, be a, uh, could help a remedy is creating safe space. Safe space. In our churches where people can come forward and share um, where people can talk about what they're experiencing, whether it's in the church or at home. Mm. And also a place where those who have abused can be um, turned around. Mm -hmm. 
I think that sometimes people who have been who abused have been abused. Yeah. And so if, yeah. if we don't if we don't heal mm -hmm. somewhere, the cycle has to stop. Right. To so pretend it's not there. Yeah. It's we just such pretend. a hurdle. We got to yeah. No. Thank you. JR? I think the lack of education um, for clergy, uh, for seminarians, uh, uh, we didn't have, I went to seminary and this was never a topic. You know, mm -hmm. it kind of went there, but it wasn't, it, it needs its own class. It needs its own credits. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to be able to, to have a class just on that. So that when these seminary, you're going out to preach and teach, you should know uh, how to deal with this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, in Sunday school, in uh, youth groups, it should not be, well, we're gonna talk about this on the side. No, this should be part of the curriculum of what domestic abuse is, how to deal with it, how to report it, what the signs and symptoms are, you know, and people be able to share their stories without fear of being uh, labeled or whatever. But I think education, educating the, the, the religious community as well as the, uh, you know, the surrounding community, I think it gives everybody, it, it takes the, the, the shame away. It takes mm -hmm. the, the, you know, it is what we do. It should be a thing that we do, just like we do vacation Bible school. You know, it should be, it should be a thing. Right. It should not be something that we shy away from. Well, like a stigma. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah, that's great. Liz? I think I would agree with JR. Um, I think education is a really key component. Mm -hmm. And also, I think just the overwhelming topic itself is a barrier. I think people, when they start to read up on it, like just, you know, you were saying one in three women globally, and it's, it's like, that's a staggering statistic. Mm -hmm. That means a lot of people you know are experiencing that. And it's hard to internalize that. It's hard to believe it. Mm -hmm. I mean, even as a woman, and I know like in my own family, there's four girls and one boy, three of us were raped. So if we're looking at statistics one in four, women being sexually assaulted, and none of us told anybody, we didn't even tell each other till we were adults. You can only begin to imagine the kinds of things that are happening. And that's hard to grasp. And I think as Christians, we think, oh, we've been transformed, we've been born again. This just doesn't happen here, but it does. And I think the, the, the counterpoint to that is, uh, the book begins with an example of a church deciding to talk about domestic violence and that a lot of the women in the congregation didn't even recognize that they themselves were being abused. They didn't recognize that some behaviors we're indeed abusive because they're, um, I think our theology often makes them acceptable. Uh, and and I, I, just the overwhelming, how do we address that? How, I mean, it's such a multi-pronged to really address that. We're, we have to address our theology. Uh, we have to begin to believe women which is sort of a, a thing that's everywhere. You just don't believe women. It, you, uh, and I think just accepting the facts and that, and that life is just isn't always gonna be peachy. And we need to talk about that in the church, that, that there are, uh, JR's, one of the stories she talks about is, is the Levite's concubine. And that's a brutal story. It's probably the most brutal story in scripture. I have never heard a sermon on it. And I mean, I remember the first time I read it, just as a believer, I was just like, I, I, it's hard to describe how I felt after read, reading it because the fact that it was there, the fact that it's ignored, the fact that I've never heard a sermon on that and nobody seems to have an opinion about, excuse me? I. That impacts women. That impacts the way we see ourselves as part of the body of Christ. And so I think part, one big barrier is just how difficult this topic is. And um, one, I guess we just need to stop avoiding it. Well, that's what this book is doing, so yay. <laughs> Jean? 
I would uh, echo what my co-panelists have said, both the secrecy and silence. Ignorance is the word that I was going to bring up, just the ignorance of the topic, the ignorance of the effect, um, even the ignorance of um, biblical exegesis that, again, continue to put women as second-class citizens. Uh, Mimi says something, um, I've heard you say this a number of times, that the Bible isn't patriarchal, but was written in a patriarchal culture, something to that yeah. effect. Mm -hmm. And when the culture is not uh, exegeted, and you have people who then continue to perpetuate um, the biases of women um, that then lead to justifications for ill treatment now, that's again the ignorance that I think is the underlying bias that will keep um, this going. Yeah. I, I was blessed in seminary to have um, Dr. Sharon Davis Ellis, and she's gone on to do a number of uh, other books, but she had a class in which we did as pastor, you know, seminarians and pastors. Um, but part of her class was also an intervention. She'd take people to, um, there's a pro, that she'd bring a, a, a gentleman in who had a program for abusers mm -hmm. that also are gospel, is about reconciliation and healing and transformation. So again, even ignorance on how to help people and how to help um, abusers get delivered is, I think, an underlying bias that so perpetuates helpful. it. Very helpful indeed. Wisdom. Can I, can I just share something real quick on, yeah. along that line? Yeah. We uh, Years ago, um, we had a gentleman who joined our church, and when he came, he wanted to have an appointment with us. In, uh, immediately after joining. And so we met with him, my husband and I, and he wanted to let us know that he had been, um, in his teen years, he had um, been arrested for um, rape. And he was on a sexual se uh, predator's list. But he came into our church, he joined our church, and he said, I just want to know, want you all to know up front, you know, which I thought was so in, so much integrity mm -hmm. for him to tell us that. He didn't have to tell us that, mm -hmm. um, but he did. And, um, he, and he was married, he and his wife came, they sat with us together. And um, he wanted us to know that that was in his background. Mm -hmm. and, but he said, being in this church, I feel God, that there's grace for me here. Mm -hmm. wow. And I, I can't tell you how, and this was, maybe 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but, and this gentleman became one of the, I mean, one of the most revered, of course, we didn't share any of that with any other congregants, any of that, it never left the room mm -hmm. that we were in. And if they shared it with someone, that was on them, but we never did, my husband and I. But when I tell you that couple is one of the model couples in our church. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm. Because of the redemption that he received from his wife and from the community in the church. So, wisdom of the young leaders, what would you have to say? Whew. Like, what's the question? Wisdom to young leaders. Wisdom to young leaders. Um, Let me see what I wrote down because I did write something down. Um, work on your issues. Uh, 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 because Being in ministry does not exempt you from having issues. Um, and I think that we have so many people in ministry who need to be healed, who have not done the healing work. And I don't mean just coming to the altar and praying, but I mean sitting with a therapist, getting your dealing with your stuff yeah because i heard someone say this it, it sounds like a cliche but it's really true what you don't slay in your youth will rise up to slay you in your old age wow. and so deal with deal with your issues um work work on those things if you've been abused get some help because if you've not then you can turn around um the oppressed can become the oppressor. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's all, even with women who um, who, who have felt um, invisible, 
and overlooked and not valued. When we get in positions with our positional power, I heard you talk about that yesterday. Who are we empowering or are we doing to other women what was done to us? So work on your issues. Definitely. We all have them. And amen to that. <laughs> and get yeah, other training I'm... besides going to oh. seminary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> always there. Uh, I would say be intentional. Be intentional about uh, sharing uh, information about domestic violence. Be intentional mm -hmm. about how you treat women. Be intentional about how you promote women. Uh, be intentional about how you address people. You know, uh, think before you speak. You know, mm -hmm. um, do your research. You know, make sure that, you know, your words will matter. So make sure that you're very intentional about how you address issues uh, concerning women. Make sure that you are educating yourself about community resources, how to, you know, get this book and, <laughs> uh, and educate yourself on how to address these issues. Because if you don't, then later on you will find that uh, you're going to have a lot of church hurt. You're going to have some people that are really suffering at your hands because you have not done your due diligence and done, done your homework and been intentional about uh, truly ministering to the hurts of others. And can I say this also? Um, one of our ministers, um, she does a lot of work um, in um, conflict resolution with different governments and agencies. And so she always works, she always talks to us about increasing our cultural, cultural IQ. Mm -hmm. And so even when we talk about um, um, women, we should also be aware that not all women, ex you know, culturally, yes. it informs our our experiences as well yeah. as women. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. some, so don't lump us all in the same mm -hmm. category. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, know something about how women in the South or mm -hmm. African-American women or, yes. or white women or Asian women, because we all, our lived experiences are different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Inseparable. Yeah, yeah great. Mm -hmm. Liz, we, we just have a little warning here. There's two minutes left okay. to this session. I was just going to say, uh, learn, keep learning, just keep learning. Uh, the, the more research is always coming out. There's more information. Um, and there's lots more stuff being published, which is a good thing. Um, and then I would also say sort of stay in your lane. Mm. If you're a pastor, you aren't able to do everything. Mm -hmm. Learn what you can do and then partner with others mm -hmm. who can do what you can't do. Uh, so I guess that's what I was saying. And I'll just close with be courageous and dealing with issues that are pertinent and relative to people today but may not have traditionally been addressed and handled in the church and this season we've got to be courageous um, domestic violence domestic abuse mental health just things we have not dealt with well in the church <laughs> and um, so we need to be courageous thank you so much if you have questions the panelists may be willing to address individual questions uh, after we thank them. Thank you. Thank you.